Oh, uh, hello, and welcome. Pardon me, I was in the middle of a pretty good and whimsical book. Feel free to sit down and I'll read this out to you. I love reading. I, I mean, I, I like to read, but sometimes, um, I, I um... Okay, I, I've read a book once. It's this book. Anyway, as this year draws to a close, I like to look back and reflect on how this year went and think, where will we be in 2021? Will it be as crappy as this year? What will we create? With the roller coaster that has been this year, sometimes we need to take a moment away from the problems we face and enjoy a good book. Or, you know, you can listen to me ramble for about 30 minutes about an old, overblown PC game from the 90s, like a pompous piece of shit. This is a beautiful classic that I found intriguing, but never had any nostalgia for. It wasn't until about six years ago after I tried out Riven, its sequel, and the absurd Eastern Mind, The Lost Souls of Tong Nua, did I find an interest in point and click puzzle adventures, and finally got to play Miss myself. And I fell in love with it. The atmosphere, the lore, the characters, there's this blend of whimsical surrealism and science fiction that really captivated me. Observing and exploring my surroundings, finding clues, solving puzzles, and fully immersing myself into each age's atmosphere. It's been a few years since then, so this was my second time returning to the Age of Mist for this review. And a third time as I went through it again in real Mist. But by that point I already remembered all the puzzles, so this was just a speed run to capture footage. And someday I shall be returning for a fourth time in the 2020 VR re-re-re-remake. <sighs> and now I need to get a VR set. But without further ado, what exactly is Mist? Mist is a point and click puzzle adventure game developed by Cyan Worlds in 1993. Cyan was created by two brothers, Rand and Robin Miller. Rand had a background in programming while Robin worked on the visuals and music. The duo started their company in their parents' basement in 1987. Prior to Mist, the duo had created a few black and white entertainment titles for the Mac OS, The Manhole, Cosmic Osmo, and Splunk. These titles followed Mist's point and click navigation conventions, however there was no objective other than for children to interact and explore with their imagination. In 1990, the two brothers wanted to make their next project ambitious, a game that appealed to adults that involved a non-linear story, believable characters, and to have the player make an ethical choice. This prototype went by the name the Grey Summons. When pitching this idea to Activision, they rejected the idea and told the two to stick to games made for children. The two brothers weren't doing financially well. However, they were approached by the Japanese company Sunsoft for funding. The two wanted to make the game visually more engaging, but the 3D limitations at the time, this was pretty ambitious. Mist's development officially began in 1991 by a team of seven people. Mist took inspirations from Zork, Star Wars, C.S. Lewis's The Chronicles of Narnia, and the literary works of Jules Verne, even adopting the name Mist through the book The Mysterious Island. When it came to designing Mist's puzzles, they balanced the three aspects, the puzzles themselves, the environment, and the story. Before Mist entered full production, the Millers playtested their entire game as a Dungeons & Dragons campaign. Cyan wanted to create a more complicated ending to Mist, and thus included Atris into the world's plot. However, this came at the cost of the ethical decision making that the brothers had initially planned. The release of Apple QuickTime made it possible for the integration of the live action capture. The roles of Cirrus was played by Robin and Aknar and Atris were both played by Rand. For a more in-depth look into the history of Mist's series, I'd highly recommend Luda Rome's video essay as well as the documentary of The Making of Mist. Mist released for the Mac OS on September 24th, 1993 to the mostly positive reception from fans and critics praising the game for its open-world nature, graphics, sounds, and storytelling, with the gaming magazine publication Computer Gaming World referring to it as an artistic masterwork, with shared sentiments from Wired and the New York Times. Other publications praised the game for its lack of pressure and punishment and easy-to-understand vocabulary. However, on the other hand, Mist has received criticism from some publications, such as Next Generation in 1996, citing that the puzzles are trial and error and poor game design, and in 2000, IGN stated that Mist did not age well over its seven years since its release. In 1994, Mist received the Cody Award for the Best Adventure Slash Fantasy Role Playing Game and was nominated for several other rewards. Mist has been known as one of the first notable casual PC games that appealed to non gamers, as well as providing a different experience to the video game industry. Mist has sold over 6 million copies since its release and has been ported to so many consoles handhelds, and mobile devices over its past 27 years, 
making it one of the most ported video games of all time. Myst was the best selling PC game from 1993 all the way to 2002, where The Sims overtook the title. In 2013, Myst was added to the collection of video games in the Museum of Modern Art. In 1997, Myst got a sequel, Riven. However, after this title, Robin left Cyan to work on his own projects. Myst's 3 and 4 were not developed by Cyan, but instead two different teams over at Ubisoft. However, Cyan worked on Uro, Ages Beyond Myst, Myst 5, and the cancelled Myst Online Uro Live, as well as collaborating with David Wingroff on making novels based on the Myst universe. In 2016, Cyan released Abduction, a Kickstarter spiritual successor to Myst. I'll briefly cover this more in the remake section for this video, but Myst received four remakes throughout its past 27 years. In 2000, it was rebranded as Myst Masterpiece Edition. Later in that same year, Real Myst was released, which dropped the point and click navigation, but instead recreated the world in full 3D. In 2014, for the 20th anniversary, there was Real Myst Masterpiece Edition. And finally, in 2020, Myst got remastered again, but this time playable in VR. Myst was a cultural phenomenon during its release and inspired multiple imitators. The game has been used for educational and scientific purposes. A parody of Myst called Piss was created to mock the sensation of the game, which is really funny in concept, but uh, it's pretty awful in execution. But hey, John Goodman's there! Mike? For more info about that, I would recommend the video made by Brutal Moose. Atris's library is referenced in the background in the Homer Cube short in The Simpsons Treehouse of Horror 6. This was already one of my favorite Simpsons episodes, and finding out this little detail now just made me love this more. In 1999, Disney approached Cyan about the possibility of making an island theme park based on Myst. However, this never got off the ground. And in 2015, there was talks of a Hulu original show based on the game, produced by Legendary Television. However, in 2019, the rights were shifted to Village Roadshow Pictures, putting the project in development hell or unofficially canceled. Gameplay! If I can describe what the experience of playing Myst is like, it's literally the interactive version of getting lost in a book. Pun intended. I made a quip earlier about reading, but honestly, to me, I feel like Myst is one of those games where you just enjoy the content page by page, or get so incredibly bored to the point where you reread the same paragraph because your eyes are just skimming through text and not comprehending a single thing, finding the plot stupid, and throwing the book out the window. Myst is a quiet game to sit down, relax, and think as you get immersed into its world. Understandably, if all you do is run around for 30 minutes to the point of frustration and close in the game, I don't necessarily blame you. I will avoid spoiling most of the solutions to the puzzles in this game. Myst does a pretty good job at not holding the player's hand, leaving them on their own to figure things out. The Age of Myst acts as the game's hub world. Entering the library, you will find a red and blue book. Opening them will reveal TV static because books can just do that. Okay, well technically today's standards, books can do that, but I digress. The main objective of Myst is to find all of the red or blue pages and restore the respected books and free one of the two brothers, Cirrus or Aknar. You visit and explore four different worlds, Channelwood, Salantic, Mechanical, and Stoneship. These are referred to as ages. These can be done and completed in any order you wish, with each age containing a red and blue page for you to find. Most of the puzzles in Myst aren't exactly too difficult, especially compared to the later entries. That said, however, they are really satisfying for you to solve on your own. My advice when playing Myst, in order to get that authentic 90s experience, is to get a pen and paper and jot down any clues, numbers, and symbols you come across. Exploring around the ages in Myst help immerse you into the world, but it will also help you understand some of the game's puzzles. However, running around can be a tad disorienting in some areas, such as the Channelwood Age where all the tree houses look similar to one another. However, this issue was kind of fixed with the free movement in Real Mist. Each of the Age's puzzles are self-confined to their own respected level. Once completed, they never need to be revisited again. However, there's just one puzzle that breaks the self-confinement ethos, and that's this stupid Maze Runner train cart section at the end of the Salentic Age. Okay, real talk, unscripted here, this puzzle sucks. I hated this one. This is the only puzzle in the whole game of Myst that I thought was really dumb, but I want to rant about it anyway. So, um, I spent forever on this one, over an hour, 
and especially turning the whole ship 45 degrees takes forever because the cutscene has to play every single time the thing made sounds I did not know what the sounds meant and I, after a while I let my pride die and I googled what the heck to do in which MissJourney.com said hey remember the sounds that this particular device made that is found in the mechanical age. That's not the same age. That's dumb. I hated this. I spent forever on it. So eventually after writing down all the notes of where I think uh, each sound was made, I finally made it to the ending and you know, it was a great triumph, but God, this was dumb. I hated it. Thank you for coming to my- But we're not done yet! So I played this whole part again in real mist, which went a lot smoother, went a lot quicker. Uh, however, Towards the end of this footage here, mind the uh, activate windows part, mind you, I made it to the end and then I realized, oh, wait, dummy me, I forgot to pick up a page. I had to do this whole section again. Ah! Thank you. Thank you for listening to me complain for a few moments there. All right, back to, back to actually talking about how great this game is. Despite having two hands and that they're, you know, paper, you can only carry one page at a time, so if you want to collect both the red and blue pages, you'll need to go back into each age a second time and retrieve the respected page. This isn't as much of a hindrance as it sounds, as most of the puzzles will have already been completed from your previous entry. However, buckle up Chris are spending time in the train cart again! Oh! But in all seriousness, besides the whole maze runner part, Mist is pretty cathartic and relaxing if you take the time to stop and slow down for it. And this is coming from someone who is a coffee addicted workaholic who needs to be working 24 seven or else he'll explode. I think the puzzles have that right amount of difficulty. They aren't stupidly easy, but they're also not difficult to the point of rage quitting. Unlike Riven. The aha moments when you find the solution and run back to solve your current puzzle is really just an exhilarating experience. Okay, so spoilers ahead here. If you don't want this mystery boom spoiled to you, uh, feel free to skip to this section with the time code here. Or if you only want to hear me talk about the game's themes, then jump to here. Besides the intro cutscene of the stranger, otherwise known as you, the player, falling through the cosmic fissure, Mist doesn't directly tell you the story. You have to piece that together yourself by reading Atrus's remaining journals, viewing the message chamber, and having the game's visuals and environment explain what happened in each age. Insert dumb pun about a picture being worth a thousand words. One of the first things that players will discover is a letter from Atris addressed to his wife Catherine, as well as a hollow message of him telling his wife that he believes one of his sons have burned the books within his library. In the library, we learn about the two brothers, Cirrus and Aknar, who are trapped in the red and blue books respectively. Both of the brothers plead with you to find the pages and release them from their books. As you collect more pages, each of the brothers will inform you that they were wrongfully imprisoned, blaming the other brother for what happened in the library, making it your objective to choose which of the two brothers you decide to free. Once the player has collected all the pages of either book, that brother will inform the player that the last page is located behind the fireplace in the library, and to avoid the green book. This book contains Atris, who is imprisoned in the age called Denny. Before I go over the endings, I'm going to talk a bit about the lore because there is a lot of ground to cover here and I'm just going to restrict this to the first missed game because this expanded so much over its five games, spinoff, and four books. And reading wiki article after wiki article really fried my brain so researching the lore for this part of the video took forever to do. So uh, I'm going to try to summarize it as best as I can here. Atris is the father to Cirrus and Akinar and husband to Catherine. He is a descendant as a mix of human and Denny. Denny is also not only an age, but it's also a species. This species has been known to live underground and can live up to three centuries. There's a lot more to it, but summarization. Atris as well as Catherine have the ability known as the Ark. This allows them to write in books and create ages. These books are known as descriptive books. To access and warp to these written ages, they use a different book called a linking book, which sync up to their corresponding descriptive book. Note that the linking books are smaller and portable and can be replicated. Atris also explores these ages and will sometimes spend months within them, documenting his discoveries within his journals. In Atris's journals, he depicts the visual imagery of each age, as well as some of their inhabitants, if any. 
In these entries, he often lends a hand and aids the civilians by creating inventions or informing them about phenomena, such as rain in Stone Ship. Atreus is depicted as being respectful and having a wanderlust of learning about the cultures, language, behaviors, and philosophies of each age he explores. In their younger days, Atreus would bring Cirrus and Akinar to some of these ages, such as Channelwood or Mechanical, for them to experience the wonders and adventures that each age had to offer. Atreus also created multiple linking books back to Myst, and he always brings one with him so he can return home whenever he pleases. It wasn't until Tiana, Atreus's grandmother, Again, these people can live up to three centuries, just putting that fact out there, who died tragically while visiting an age that Catherine created. This event caused the family turmoil that eventually leads to the events of Mist. Her death isn't explained, however Catherine stops writing ages and falls into depression. Atris focuses more on his research, leaving his sons to feel emotionally neglected. As the boys grew older, they acted out and became more rebellious. Initially kidnapped, Cirrus and Aknar joined with a group of pirates known as the Black Ships from the Mechanical Age. This brought the brothers a sense of power. With the brothers' knowledge of Atreus's technology and a copy of a missed linking book, they conquered all of the Mechanical Age. In Atreus's journal, the age was depicted of dark skies tied to the Black Ships' existence. However, in-game, the skies are blue. This suggests that once in power, Cirrus and Aknar overthrew the Black Ships as well. Both brothers became greedy for power. Cirrus, the younger brother, is more sophisticated and megalomaniacal. Besides the Salantic Age, his rooms were all lavishly decorated with expensive treasures, gems, and knickknacks of his exploits. He is much more aristocratic, deceptive, and tactical of the two. Aknar, on the other hand, is more mentally unstable, brutal, and sociopathic. Unlike his younger brother, Aknar doesn't really have much of a desire for elegant lifestyles but instead finds joy in controlling, hurting, torturing, and killing people. In his rooms, you will find the torture devices and bones of its inhabitants, even portraying himself as a false god to the monkey creatures of Channelwood. We can rule them like gods. Angry gods. It is believed that Aknar is the reason why each age no longer has any inhabitants, while Cirrus was pulling the strings to claim the world's riches for himself. To hide their crimes from their father, the two try to hide the evidence by burning Atreus's library with only a few journals surviving. It isn't fully explained on what type of books were burned, but it is believed that it's a combination of journals, descriptive books, and linking books. The brothers then plan a coup d'etat to trap their parents, tricking their mother Catherine to go to Riven, which leads to the events of the sequel, and Atreus to Denny. Cirrus had Aknar rip a single page from Atreus's missed linking book without their father knowing preventing him from being able to return to Mist. Why they didn't burn the page afterwards, I do not know. Also how the red and blue pages ended up in all the other ages isn't fully explained either. But before his entrapment, Atreus left the red and blue books as a means to trap any greedy explorers, unbeknownst to him that he would trap his own sons. So with all that exposition out of the way, let's get back to the conclusions here. If the player chooses to free Cirrus, he will switch places with the player and thank you for freeing him only to then scold you and call you a fool for doing so. He'll then start to rip the pages out of the book while mocking you. As more and more pages are ripped, the vision starts to get more static till all you see is black. And congratulations, you dong goofed. Also, I love it in Real Mist, the game adds this unsettling ambient sound of your entrapment and it's, it's pretty spooky. I like it. I want out. Should the player choose to release Aknar, he is ecstatic about his freedom. And then without hesitation, he immediately proceeds to rip the pages out in excitement as well, entrapping you in once again, in nothingness. The symbolisms of trusting the men in the red and blue books, only for them to inevitably screw you over, is an obvious commentary on the American two-party political system. Hey, -oh, we went political! Oh! Okay, okay, I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Or am I? Hashtag trap our corrupt politicians in books. When the player opens the green book, Atreus immediately warns the player to not link to Denny yet, but to find the missing page to his missed linking book. He then laments about the actions his sons have made, fills you in on what has occurred, and to not trust Cirrus or Akinar. Should the player enter the book before bringing the page, a defeated Atreus will scold you for not heeding his warning seriously. And congratulations, you're now stuck in Denny with him forever, and he's too busy to trying to fix Riven to bother to talk to you. The end. And finally, the true canon ending is when the player brings Atreus the missing page of his linking book. 
Where is that final page, you may ask? Here, actually. It's always been here. There was a joke to this. Atris thanks the player and is disponent of his son's betrayal towards him. He informs the player that he has to make a difficult decision and warps back to Mist. A few minutes later, he returns and thanks the player again and informs you that it's important that he continues to write as his wife Catherine is in danger. He then requests that he will need your assistance someday. Did somebody say sequel? But says you are freely able to return and explore the Ages of Mist. Upon returning to the library, as you turn around, all you see is burned pedestals. To make sure that the two would never hurt or trick anyone again, Atris had to make the difficult decision to burn the two books and thus killing his two sons. Taking the context of all the events leading up to the ending of Mist is really tragic. Family turmoil is kind of a recurring theme throughout the Mist series. Not every family is supportive, and in some cases, members can be terrible people. Family also doesn't have to be depicted by blood. Your close friendships can be family as well. But it's always unfortunate to see members fall apart, bonds being broken, and having one turn against one another. In such an extreme and exaggerated case such as Mist, it's emotionally devastating to have a father who laments and wishes he could have been there for his sons when they needed him, ultimately and reluctantly making the decision to kill them for their inhumane crimes and tyranny. Or at least that would have been the case if it wasn't for Mist 4! Yeah, so they retcon Sirius and Aknar's death at the beginning of Mist 4 and instead sent them to different imprisonment ages. Why wouldn't Atris just tell you this in the first place? I don't know! I have yet to finish Mist 4 myself, so I can't comment if it's worth the play or not, but this revelation, <laughs> see what I did there, completely throws out the severity and stakes that the conclusion to the first game had. Mist 4 also wasn't written by the Miller Brothers or Cyan Worlds, so thanks Ubisoft. Mist as a game takes place after all the chaos and conflict has already passed, leaving nothing but empty and desolate worlds, no inhabitants left, and nothing much left to save. While there is visual beauty to be had, at its core, the story of Mist is pretty macabre and tragic. The game doesn't reward you with a happy ending. Sure, Atreus is now free and can return to Mist, but he doesn't have time to relax or celebrate. Mist is also a game about the infinite possibilities, achievements, and scientific innovations that mankind can make. Each age in Mist is a delightful blend of organic and natural landscapes with man-made technological advancements and engineering. There's this sense of episodic romanticism within Atreus' journals, adventuring and exploring the worlds around him finding fascination in the science and philosophies each age presents him. Some literary works that come to my mind personally is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn, and Jonathan Swift's satirical Gulliver's Travels. Exploring these ages yourself is also a visual representation of romanticism, as you create your own adventure observing each of Atris's worlds, taking in the beauty of nature and the imagination an individual and a society can create. Now Fox, you may be asking yourself, that's a lot of big brain words to say about a game about flipping dumb switches and helping out a couple of nerds who are stuck in books. I think you're just being pretentious. And to that I say, yeah, I, I kinda am actually. I don't think Mist is perfect, but the plot and lore behind Mist is pretty interesting to me personally. Mist does take itself pretty seriously, and the plot became much more of an element in the sequels. But back when I played Mist for the first time, I really got into the series, and I played Riven, Mist 3, and started Mist 4 back to back shortly after. This was before Ubisoft also added Mist 3 and 4 on Steam, so I had to go buy them used off eBay. Mist, to me, is one of those works of fiction where it's just fun to learn more about the universe and its characters. Overall, to put it shortly, I really enjoyed the story that Mist had to tell. Mist had multiple remakes throughout its past 27 years. While certainly dated, especially compared to Riven, I think the 1993 version still holds up pretty well, especially for its time. Real Mist also feels pretty dated as well. There isn't really anything particular to note about it. For a 2000s game, it looks really good and it gets the job done. Real Mist Masterpiece Edition does improve the overall visual experience. However, with the Real Mist games, it does make the full motion videos from 1993 look really jarring in comparison. That said, there's something about the 90s pre-rendered 3D that I personally love, but that's just me. From the gameplay footage I've seen of the 2020 release, 
it looks incredibly gorgeous. Mist has this elegant aesthetic blend of surrealism, nature, and also incorporating technological infrastructure and technology from multiple eras and cultures, including primitive, Greek, European, industrial revolution, and modern, as well as sci-fi into its environments. The cutscene and actor portrayal isn't exactly the best. It comes off pretty cheesy. Oh, yeah! yeah. However, the roles were played by the Miller brothers, and you gotta give them props for doing almost everything with this game. Rand Miller redid his role as Atris in the real Mist versions of the game. You can tell just by the higher resolution on him. From the bits of gameplay that I have seen, I'm not super crazy about the 3D models that the 2020 version uses. I know it's just a technological decision for its time, but I felt that the video motion capturing that the original Mist games had helped give it its own identity. The sound design is also incredibly stellar. Most of Mist's environments are either silence or ambient effects. A conscious decision that the Miller Brothers had was to not include music that would distract from the gameplay. However, they later strategically put in synthesized tracks to help enhance the mood and tension for specific rooms. The game's score is overall whimsical, but very unsettling and creepy. Chris Brandcamp also provided the game with sound effects. The quiet ambience of Mist really enhances the immersion. The usage of mechanical and scientific sounds for the game's puzzles has this whimsical, yet somewhat playful feel to it. I'll keep this part pretty brief. The original 1993 Mist and the 2000 Mist Masterpiece Edition are practically the same, just that the Masterpiece Edition enhanced from 8-bit to 24-bit and remastered the score. Real Mist 2000 replaced the point-and-click features by allowing the player to roam freely in 3D. This version also included a tombstone for Tiana, as well as the bonus age, Rhyme, which helped connect Mist to its sequel, Riven. This version also included day and night cycles and weather effects. Interestingly, this version is no longer available on Steam, which confused the hell out of me until I realized that Real Mist and Real Mist Masterpiece Edition are completely separate games. Congratulations, Cyan, you've thrown yet another puzzle for me to crack. Real Mist Masterpiece Edition on 2014 brought back the option to point and click, and it was completely rebuilt on the Unity engine. And finally, dropping this convoluted real and masterpiece naming sequences, we're back to just Mist for 2020, which has VR support and puzzle randomization for Mist veterans. So, should you play Mist, and does it still hold up today? I think it's definitely worth a try at the very least. While I enjoyed it, and I still think it holds up really well, I understand that this game is not for everyone. Mist requires commitment and patience in order to get the most out of this game. If you're stumped, MistJourney.com is a good source if you need just hints but without getting the solutions handed to you. Engaging with the plot and lore alone is a pretty entertaining experience, albeit more simple than its successors. As for which version of Mist to play, I think that would fall under personal preference. I like the limitations that the original 93 and Masterpiece version had. I could be the minority that prefers this one, but that's just me. I think the tank-like controls of Real Mist can be a tad annoying, especially to newcomers, but it's not a deal breaker. I believe Real Mist Masterpiece Edition fixed this issue, but I haven't played this version myself. Based on the reviews that other people have made, I'm going to go ahead and say that the 2020 version of Mist is probably the best way to play this game, and I'm hoping that Cyan will give Riven and Exile the similar treatment someday down the line. The classic Mist Masterpiece Edition is available on Steam, iOS, and Android, and Real Mist Masterpiece Edition is available on Steam, Mac, iOS, Android, and Nintendo Switch, with the 2020 remake available on the Oculus Store and coming soon to Steam by the time of this recording, and I encourage you to check it out. Thank you so much for sticking around, I greatly appreciate your viewership. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to leave me a like and subscribe if you're new. This was a lot of fun to do, uh, however there was a lot of research that had to go into it, um, but I really enjoyed my time back on Mist Island, and I'm sure there's a lot of things that I've missed to include in the script, but uh, oh well. Um, but let me know what your thoughts are about Mist or my video, uh, I'd love to hear it, and I hope that you and your family and loved ones have a happy and safe holiday season and that 2021 will just be a much better year for everybody. Till next time, friends. Take care.